Okay, so uh, hi everyone, this is Finance Meets Real Estate. Uh, so we meet here every Tuesday. Um, we have amazing guests like our guest here tonight. And um, we discuss real estate, finance as well, different topics. We've had over 100 guests so far. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about, um, you know, what spot from in, into real estate syndication, multifamily syndication, starting out as a, I believe, graphic designer before. Um, and so, uh, so what is an active investor, uh, sponsor, JV partner? Um, I believe he has done close to 400 units at this point, right, Vod? Um, and so also some land development. He's a real estate agent also, and he's in charge of, so his firm is called Zontic Ventures. And he's a member of like the National Real Estate Investor Network. Um, so I'm going to let Vod introduce himself better, but I want to hear his story about getting into the space and um, what excites him about the space and essentially, you know, what what the whole <laughs> the whole story is there. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to you, Vlad. And oh. um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to speak up. We're doing an open Q&A. And um, so, we, you know, we'll, we'll have a conversation here. So go ahead, Vlad. Yeah, sure. Um, basically, picture this. You're sleeping in a nice warm bed covered by blankets without a worry in the world. And then those blankets are being torn off and a ice bucket of like cold water is being poured on top of you. This is exactly how my uh, real estate journey began because I was a very, very happy graphic designer. Had a great job five minutes away from my house. I used to print billboards that you see on the side of the highway. Uh, and, uh, like we used to wrap buses with graphics. So it was really cool. And then COVID hit and everything changed because I got furloughed and I have a mortgage, a wife, two kids. And, uh, we started thinking something's not working. We have to be more in control of our future and in control of our own destiny. So what do we need to do for that? And uh, one thing kind of led to another. We started reading a few books. I actually read Kiyosaki's book, as most people uh, have. And you know what? It clicked, but not fully. I kind of didn't get it at first, right? I didn't know. Like, it, how's it for me? Because my personality, I'm a green. And green means safe. I, I want to know where my next paycheck is coming from. I want to be like very, 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 I don't like to cause any waves. And uh, one thing that got me over to real estate is one simple thing. Uh, let's have extra income and you don't have to really do that much for it. Became a real estate agent in New Jersey, still am, by the way. Um, you have to do a lot for it though. I thought it's like no big deal. You just list the house, kind of put it on MLS, done deal, and you get your commission. Oh boy, I was wrong. Um, so I got called back to work and while I was still during COVID and then at night I used to study for that real estate exam. It took like 75 hours or something like that, 77, took night classes passed the test, got my license, started selling some houses and it, it worked, you know, like I, I see, I, I like it more and more because before that, the only house I purchased was my house with a real estate agent on MLS. So basically zero experience. Um, and then a few meetings started coming up and meetings here in New Jersey where people are like, oh, this cool thing is the best thing in the world called wholesaling. Let's go check it out. And I'm like, what is that? What? So we're sitting there in the meeting and this guy goes, well, you lock up a house on the contract and then you kind of assign it to an end buyer and you get the, the difference. I'm like, this is so cool. Did that for a little bit. Not very successful. I didn't like it very much. There was too much competition and it was uh, not that competition scares me. It was a lot of negative competition, a lot of backstabbing. And uh, it wasn't for me whatsoever. Started doing a little rehabbing and then realized that you have to keep on grinding all the time, nonstop. You're like a hamster in the wheel. You got to keep on going. As soon as you stop prospecting, 
the whole thing just is over. It's stopped. So natural progression was get rentals. So we got one rental, one single family house at that time in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which is all the way down by Philly, an hour and a half. And we also got it off an MLS, but it was so nice that we were netting a thousand dollars. And I say were, I'll tell you later why we sold that house literally two days ago, but we were netting a thousand dollars a month, which is a great, great, uh, you know, income stream. But that's from one house. And then, of course, depreciation comes into that. A lot of tax savings does this more things. So still, uh, we were still this and thinking, how many houses do we need to buy to really like to support our lifestyle? And we're not, you know, fancy, wouldn't drive uh, crazy cars or live in a crazy house. Um, so kind of a natural thing was my wife said, why didn't you try multifamily? And I'm like, I have no idea what it is. I'm like, what is it like, how can, how can I even do this thing? So we were sitting there watching TV. And then my wife goes, I bought you a ticket to this conference called MFIN. I'm like, where is it? Is it like in uh, uh, like Bergen County? Where, where is it? Is it? Is it in New Jersey? She's like, no, it's in Houston. I'm like, please tell me Houston is in New Jersey somewhere. She's like, no, Houston's in Texas. I'm like, what? We go into Texas? And uh, she's like, yeah, we fly into Texas. I'm like, but it's so expensive. Look at this. The, the ticket's like $150 plus the plane, the hotel. And I don't, what am I doing there? Well, listen, this conference changed my life. After I saw nearly 800 people packed into this hall, everybody sharing stories and helping you and answering questions and being so gener generous with their time. I'm like, this is exactly where I want to be. We come back home. I immediately, I, I got fire everywhere. <laughs> like, let's go. We need to get a mentor or we need to get some sort of education. So we started interviewing all the uh, mentors in multifamily space and uh, we picked Jake and Gino. So um, um, after we joined Jake and Gino, that was a year ago. And at that time I quit from, I quit my job. I said, hey, listen, I started losing opportunities in real estate and single family space and also could not keep up the whole education um, on multifamily side. It was like drinking from like a, 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 a water hose, something like that. It's just too much. And I was missing opportunities. I was not there. So I'm like, all right, uh, I have some stuff coming from real estate. So I'm going to leave my W-2. And I did. And best decision of my life. And uh, concentrating fully on multifamily. And uh, shortly after, I would say six to eight months or so, um, I got my first deal. It's a JV. It was a JV opportunity in uh, uh, in Brandonton. It's right outside of Sarasota. We purchased seven. It's a JV opportunity. So seven acres of land, but it's only eight units. But the value is not in the units. It's in the land because apparently it's it's in it's in a zone where you can you can build ninety six apartments. So right now we are rezoning the thing. And it should be done by October. And we're looking to either exit by the year's end or build 96 doors on it. Uh, so that's my very, very first deal. But in between there, it was a lot of networking, a lot of education, and a lot of trying to prove myself that I'm not a graphic designer anymore, but a, a, real, a realtor or a, a, you know a multifamily investor. And that was the hardest thing because people are still calling me and they're like, so what's new in Photoshop? I'm like, guys, I have no idea. I haven't done Photoshop in like eight months. I, I don't even have it on my computer. And I was telling them all the time, hey, listen, this is what's happening with the rates. This is what's happening with the market. This is, this is where the insurance is. Oh, did you hear about this, uh, like, for example, flood in Texas? Because my market's Texas and Kansas City. And I also buy in uh, the Carolinas. 
So I always tell them like, oh, by the way, do you know there's a new stadium building in Kansas City? And they're like, how do you know all this? I'm like, because I'm buying in Kansas City. And they're like, yeah, right. I'm like, yeah, we purchased 40 units there last month. They're like, what do you mean 40? I'm like, 40 apartments. They're like, no, no, can't be. I'm like, here's the pictures. They were, It was me touching the building. <laughs> I'm like, right there, look. They're like, how can you do this? How is this possible? I'm like, it's not me. It's the team. Team purchased it. Myself included with us. So it was five people that brought in capital, also a JV. And I found that deal off market, direct to seller. And... Uh, uh, got 40 units and uh, closed it on December 2nd. So it's it's going great over there in Kansas City. And the, the cool thing is that initially I kind of regretted of going into single family and kind of quote unquote wasting my time where I could have just jumped into multifamily, you know, and skipped this whole thing. But now come to think of it, I I think it's right because I, I've i taken all the parts from single family, like cold calling, speaking with sellers, and all the tools that I have, and transitioned them into multifamily. So I'm doing pretty much the same thing. Just, I would say, a little more sophisticated, where you're speaking with sellers, uh, potential sellers, who are, I would say, business owners, because it is a business having a multifamily so business owners and um, asking them basically to sell their property to me and it happened it worked within the first um, eight months so that's that was my second deal in Kansas City um, it was it was an awesome awesome deal I loved it and then I've connected with some uh, folks in Texas where uh, they asked me to try to raise capital and I'm like okay that sounds interesting let's try it why not so there was a, an opportunity in San Antonio. It's 208 doors. And I'm like, yeah, let's go. How difficult can that be? Right? It's just ask people. From, <laughs> well, it's pretty hard. But uh, come to think of it. But I got really, really lucky. You know, in the first race, everybody's like, oh, my God, you're going to get like 20,000, if not less. And, and it's 5 or 6C, so I could advertise it. So I'm thinking I'm going to just blow up the Facebook and you know, with this uh, advertising and uh, people will advertise with me, but people are still going like, hey, Vlad, he's the uh, graphic designer guy. So that was the most difficult thing that I have to, that I, I had to do to completely remove myself from my previous employment and move myself into this new chapter in my life. And uh, the way I've done it is, educating people on what's happening and educating people on um, the possibilities of real estate, especially multifamily. Like even flippers now, they come to me and they're like, oh yeah, I, I can make $50,000 in the flip. I'm like, okay, well, how much are you keeping after taxes? And they're like, oh, oh. And they immediately become quiet. And I'm like, listen, you can take some of that money invest in real estate or in multifamily you hold it or you can invest as a passive investor and get the bonus depreciation all the tax savings keep on flipping but every once in a while buy something else invest into into, into multifamily even as a as a passive investor and I, I and i try to teach them all the opportunities and possibilities of it and slowly but sure, surely people kind of started thinking of me as a as a, a real estate investor and most importantly multifamily i still do residential sales i like it um until basically the uh, i would say the snowball effect of multifamily becomes really noticeable let's just say because it takes some time for the thing to build up it's not overnight as you all know it might take I don't know, a year, two years, maybe, uh, maybe even more until basically a big refi. So that's why I have my uh, uh, realtor license and I'm still selling here in New Jersey. And uh, uh, that was that was the deal. So I started raising for this five or six C, right? And I got this guy 
who really needed his 1031 money to be placed in the syndication. And I didn't even know it was possible. I'm like, how is this possible? Apparently it is. Tenants in common. So he gave in. He he said, my amount is a million. And I'm like, did I just raise a million dollars? Well, I raised 1.4. but the, And I was so happy. I'm like, all right, that's it. Two, two weeks before closing. I'm sitting there pumped. I'm like, two weeks. I'm like counting the money in my head, how much I'm going to get. And that's what, that's what, uh, that was in September. Uh, yeah. In uh, or like August, I think of last year or something like that. You you remember what's happening in August. The rates are going like crazy. You know, everybody's afraid. They are jumping up like 75 bips. The lender got scared. Pulled out of the deal two weeks before closing. And we couldn't close on the deal because uh, uh, the new lender said the rates were significantly higher. And we couldn't do anything. We couldn't uh, renegotiate the price. So everything, uh, I, I I was really like, really down because, hey, listen, this is like huge payday and huge like jump into multifamily, right? 208 doors in one transaction this is unbelievable. And uh, it didn't happen. I got, I got really disappointed over that, but I picked myself up and kept on going kept on driving and uh, there were a few more deals in uh, the Carolina market. We bought 40 doors in uh, Boone in North Carolina and Columbia, South Carolina. That was student housing, uh, 39 doors. So those uh, are smaller JVs. And uh, then after that, I started working on 419 doors in Dallas, uh, also co-GP. And uh, right now on another deal also in Dallas. So overall, really, really exciting, a lot of learning opportunity. But what's what's more, more important is I'm trying to be out there to teach people that it's totally doable and possible within the fairly short time because people have been in, the, in this industry for what, two, three years and they have like a few thousand doors already. So it's just taking constant action and moving forward, don't let anybody stop you. So that's where I am now. Um, it's really exciting. And uh, I'm pumped over what's happening now. A lot of people are kind of afraid, you know, sellers are not selling, crazy rates everywhere, people are afraid. You know, just adjust with the times, right? Just adjust. Because if you think five years ago, rates were the same, people were buying. Come on, same thing, just redo your underwriting a little bit and one tip that uh, uh in jake and gino bill ham is my underwriting coach and he goes listen everybody's trying to underwrite to make the deal work right everybody's doing that right let's make the deal work let's you know do some something with the numbers he goes like this forget that try to kill the deal if you cannot kill it buy it see so kill the deal. Try to kill it as much as you can. And if you cannot kill it, then you buy. Just poke holes in it as much as you can. Put crazy assumptions in there. And if it's still cash flowing at that point, then yeah, let's go. Like Steve, Steve right there, I see him. He's, a, he's in the deal. Uh, we're in the deal together. And it's an awesome deal in the Carolinas. You know, it's fantastic. Because uh, Steve's also part of Jake Gino, and uh, we all got connected, you know, plus we live nearby. So <laughs> that's another uh, 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 bonus that we get to see each other more often. But yeah, it's, uh, it, it, and I still trying to uh, tell people, hey, listen, take advantage of this. At least if you don't want to be full time in multifamily or real estate period, use us. Because we know we are in it full time. And if you want to get something else, like let's say in Vegas or, uh, you know, in Florida, totally fine. I'll connect you to a person that's buying in Florida, that's buying in Vegas. You don't want to buy apartments. You want to do storage, RV, no problem. Let's do it. I'll connect you to a person because I just do apartments. I I just, I, I don't want to touch anything else but multifamily because in my opinion, as I learned in Jake and Gino, I believe it's the safest investment and also it's basic human need. 
right? They ha people have to live somewhere. They're not going to buy houses if the rates are high, right? Or they might buy less. They're going to have to live somewhere. They're going to rent. Who are they going to rent from? Us. And we're very happy to give them all the rents, the, all the rentals they uh, they're looking for. So, so that that's just my kind of a little story. If anybody got any questions, please put it in the chat or just ask away, because I'm gonna yak forever. No questions. Or if you want to just raise your hand, that works too. I'll ask a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can we, uh, yeah. David, can we, can we get Alex first and we'll, we'll get you after. Thanks. Thank you guys so much for pulling it out in this meeting. Uh, Vlad, so, uh, so uh, the first deal, you know, so I'm, I'm also like trying, uh, I'm looking into multifamily doing underwriting, you know, but being like, uh, how do you get a KP? How do you get like the first deal? Like, I know the toughest one is the first deal, you know, if you're yeah. the GP. Yeah, I I always been GP or co-GP. I never been an LP in a deal. Thanks. First deal is the most difficult. It might take people a year and a half to get their first deal. You have to underwrite a lot uh, to get to get the first deal. Um, I think connecting with somebody and providing some sort of a value or something it's one of the biggest things. You can do like, for example, if you find the deal, you're in the deal because you're calling all the shots, right? Um, but another way you can help is, let's say, if you can raise capital, if you can uh, you can be a capital raiser. That's one of the big things that you can do to enter the space because all the all the operators are looking for what? They're looking for equity, especially now because LT, excuse me, LTV is very low. We're looking at what sixty percent, let's say. So we have to raise forty plus plus capex. Yeah. So you have to. Um, that's one of the things. So if you know people like coworkers or friends that have capital, one of the things that you can do is, for example, um, I know um, a lot of operators. They might be like, "Hey, this new guy. Do we want to give him a shot or something like that?" There's there's actually somebody taught me this thing. Once you connect with like, let's say another capital raiser, right? What you can do is like me, for example, and you, Alex, uh, we, I'm on a deal already, right? But I'm raising for it. You can't be on a deal because you're gonna dilute the pool of GPs. GP have a certain percentage. We, we, we make an LLC together and that LLC is raising the capital for that deal. Right, so you raise and me. So let's say you raise five hundred thousand, I raise five hundred thousand. Whatever the LLC makes, we split it fifty fifty. You raise more, I raise less. No problem. You get more, I get less. So and then you already have. You can claim as you raised for that building, and you are GP on that deal. So that's one of the ways you can get in. Another, of course, obviously, like I said, finding a deal or speaking with brokers. Or going direct to seller, that's that's another way. Or you can be, let's say, boots on the ground. Let's say if you're in Texas, um, I call you, I'll be like, hey, listen, I need to walk this property. I'm in Jersey, you're in Texas, do me a favor, why don't you walk it? And um, like, for example, in our mastermind, this, this guy, Yosef, I think he was interviewed by Stefan last time, and uh, he's an attorney. So how he got in, he started doing attorney work for free for an operator for syndicators and he's like let me just read your uh, financials here i'll do it completely for free no big deal and he did it i believe for like six months and now two years into it he's done 23 deals i think already it, 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 i'm blown away he is literally in the core of you know uh that uh, mih and he's doing crazy deals. So he's a really, really good guy. And uh, I'm going to deal with him as well in Kansas City. So that's one of our markets. So that's why you get in. But be, be patient, education, and just keep going. Don't stop. Keep going. Because as soon as you stop, your momentum kind of stops. So just keep rolling. You know, um, so try that. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Fala. One more question. So, uh, most of the deals uh, that you got there are from brokers or direct to seller? Uh, um, oh, one deal I got from direct to seller. That's the 40 units in Kansas City. All the other deals I got by creating a relationship with somebody. That's why I'm going to, for example, to, to why is this, this meeting was moved? Uh, because I'm going to uh, Best Ever Conference in Salt Lake City. Uh, that's I'm flying out tomorrow. And those face-to-face -face meetups are huge. I'm going to approximately four to five a year. Um, I've been to two already. And they're, they're really, really important because like, for example, right now we are on Zoom and uh, it's great. You know, like I see you, see me. But one face-to-face -face, uh, like chat changes everything it changes the way you kind of feel about each other and the way you look so it's it's really it it that's why i really like in-person meetups and going to those events um and plus people see your face they see who you are and they're like oh yeah i know that guy i know that guy because i constantly go like this i'm vlad i buy in dallas and houston and kansas city i say it all the time and people like who do i know that buys in kansas city hmm vlad because he's constantly repeating it all the time, and I'm known for that. So it, it makes sense, you know. You can see the face again. So yeah. So I'm also in New Jersey. We spoke. I think we just never met face to face. So we definitely need to do that. So thank you. I appreciate it, and we'll talk. Thank you, uh, David. Go ahead. Thanks for your patience. Do you mind unmuting? Yeah. Yeah. So as to say, congratulations, Vlad. I can certainly relate to your situation there. Um, uh, we've focused on just about uh, seven or eight states below the frost line, you know, and uh, uh, not in inner city because we first do a police report <laughs> on the community, make sure we can have it as a safe, you know, dependable facility and not uh, some at-risk place. Um, South Carolina, yes, I was there about six years. Columbia, and we watched on Gervais Street how... Uh, the student housing uh, was improving. Uh, the last um, eight or nine months uh, out of Houston, we have a assisted living facility uh, in Spring, Texas, which is the Northwest Quadrant. So there's a lot of um, emerging markets in certain pockets that are marvelous. I agree with you, the face-to-face -face is really helpful for the investors, you know, to pull them together. Uh, two groups we've used is RE Mentor out of Boston. They, for the last 20 years, um, Dave Lindahl, but most of all the mentoring which is essential for the um, uh, sponsors, you know, those that have 7,500 doors or so that can sign for it with the equity and liquidity and then, you know, generate co-GPs. Another group I've worked with, in fact, just uh, finishing with them on a phone uh, uh, a conference call today is Eastern Union uh, out of Jersey and, and New York there uh, because they're a very large uh, equity and debt structure group. And uh, a, the, um, the CEO is actually quite, quite good. Um, so I admire your step-by-step -step progress. That's great. Uh, especially when you have a wife that encourages you. You know, that's, that's brilliant. Uh, you're really she, blessed with that. That's fantastic. Actually, yeah. She's actually the driving force behind yeah. this. She uh, she encourages me to move forward as much as possible yeah. and uh, uh, helps me um, as much as she can. But, uh, you know... Uh, it, it's really good to have somebody that's, you know, encouraging and she's very, you know, she's like, let's try this, let's try that. What is going to work? You know, don't get burnt out. Just do what's most important. And uh, what I found out is that reading books and like limiting what you do, you don't have to do everything. Just do one thing, but be awesome at it. Like if you, if you're great at negotiation, just do negotiation. Don't, like I, there was a person uh, at a previous event and he goes like this, I'm great at creative financing. I've done like over a hundred creative financing deals. And then he goes, I need to raise capital. What do I need to do for that? And I'm like, listen, if you're awesome at creative financing, don't raise capital, buy creative financing. If you want to raise capital, ask capital raisers, right. you know, find them. You get them to raise capital because that's what they're good at yeah. right get great at one thing i'm like concentrate on i'm like i go to like this i tell them 
let's say you're going to raise capital, which is a full-time job. It's yeah. not that easy, you know, nurturing and then the constant communication stuff like that. And I'm like, what if there's a creative deal coming up and you're going to miss it because you were too busy raising capital. You're going to lose on this opportunity. So get good at one thing or maybe two things, but I say one and be like awesome at it. Be yeah. known for that. Yeah, and pull it together that, that is, has the skill set, the talent, their mindset, you know, and they, they can cooperate. Yeah. Um, yes, I agree. Um, and then finding people that can work together. <laughs> On some of these deals, I've had to dismiss people. Either they were too greedy, uh, they weren't transparent, um, just they didn't know how to coordinate with people. I agree with your first words. I wrote them down, safe and green. You know, I can identify with that approach to life. Yeah. Um, uh, just being able to put teams together. Yeah. That, that's one of the big things that I, I've learned from few people that I work with that, for example, when people people go like this. Oh, we're going to find the deal and then the money will come and then I get the team. No, no, no. It should be a different approach. Get the team first and then look for deals. Because let's just hypothetically say tomorrow you're all by yourself and you find the deal. What are you going to do? Who are you going to go to? And if you're not going to take action and move on this deal, it's going to be gone because somebody else will swoop in. Get the team together first and know them well like for example i i was speaking with somebody who i'm uh, working with now shirai or he's also part of uh, uh massive capital and um he's part of jake and gino and uh he goes i know my partners very well just as uh, maybe even better than their wives do you know so you have to know how much how liquid they are what what are they spending their money and time on? Like, for example, I'll just give you an example. I know it may be a difficult example, but let's just hypothetically say you work for 12 hours and somebody else works for two hours. Do you want that person as a partner? Mm, he might be a great person, but do you really want him as a partner? Let's just say you're going to say yes. Does he deserve more money than you do? And he works, you know, 10 times less than you do. Those are the difficult questions you should be asking before you get the deal. Because after you get the deal and you're going to try to split the money or uh, split responsibilities, you'll be like, nah, I don't want to do that. What do you mean you don't want to? We're in the deal. That's it. We married pretty much for five years at least. Unless stuff is going to, you know, it, and and if you think about it, you might lose your own money if if the deal goes, you know, sour. You know what's worse? Losing investors' money. Yes. Because if you if you lose investors' money, you lose reputation. Reputation, everything goes down the toilet. Yes. So it's very, very important to create structure first. Who's responsible for what? And just keep rolling. You don't want to bottleneck stuff. If you're not an underwriter, I, I can underwrite, but it's gonna it takes me like five hours and I'll make mistakes. Probably that's what my wife said anyway. But for good underwriting, it can take maybe an hour, maybe two, to do good underwriting, right? Like error free. Yes. So you know, I, can I read the model? Yes. Yeah, I know my numbers. I can read the model, but I just, I, I my underwriting is not my thing. You know, I tend to not do it because I just, you know, I cold calling. Yeah, direct to seller. Sure, I'll speak with brokers. Absolutely going after investors i will sure being out here doing events like this oh possibly i guess i'm doing them right so you just got to pick pick what you are really good at so so have you started speaking at the conferences yet i had to speak at dallas two years ago and in phoenix we only about six or seven hundred for re mentor but it's oh. neat when they come up afterwards and you want to encourage them you know they bring their families up you know in different parts of the country or they call you and they say, and then they hand the phone to the uh, broker right there, you know, or they hand the phone to the seller, you know, so you, you for the students, you know, you try and help connect them and, and give them some confidence that, uh, yes, the deal is doable. Yeah, um, I'll actually, I'll, I'm do all my interviews so far I've done on Zoom or uh, um, like on podcasts. So two days ago, I've done best ever uh, interview. And that was it with uh, Socom, uh, yeah, Socom Reed. Yeah, I, it was like my dream to do best ever. Uh, plus, I'm going to the best ever conference. What a coincidence. Yeah. Uh, but I got invited to uh, 
speak in front of like 200 people in New Jersey. It's going to be in Bergen County in Hilton Hotel in two months. Oh boy, I'm really, this is going to be my very first speaking in event. I even, I, I, I've taken speech classes Good. and uh, it's, it's, it's really difficult and uh, it's really- what about a PowerPoint? Are you going to put together a PowerPoint? Just you know what? Um, I, I was thinking about that. I have to speak with Nick. He's the organizer, Nick Tang, and uh, if he's going to do that, but it, he said it's going to be a lot of Q&A, especially because people don't know multifamily, and for them, when they think, oh my God, I'm doing a flip and it's $200,000, and here we are buying an apartment complex, $51 million, how is this possible? Like, look at these numbers, it's, it's impossible. And I'm like, hey, listen, everything is possible, you just got to put the right team together. Like, I'll give you an example. At the previous conference, I was speaking with John Montero. He is this huge operator. And uh, uh, when he was by himself, he was, I think he had like 5,000. Don't quote me on this. He yeah. had like, I think like 2,000 apartments or something like that. And then his current partner, who wasn't at the time Merrill, also, he is an SEC attorney, very su successful, also had some, uh, some apartments. But now they merged, right? So I think the company is called Revision Masters. Now they have nearly 20,000 apartments and billion of assets, worth of assets. So you see the teamwork, you know, you successful here and here, but yeah. if you put them together, you just explode. So it's really important to put the team together. I'm a huge, huge proponent of teams. Uh, even like I was doing a short sale here in New Jersey. It's a tiny little cabin in the woods, but it's a short sale. As you know, with short sales, what do you have to do? Talk to banks nonstop and negotiate and send them paperwork. It's just a total pain. I connected with a professional who knows how to do short sale. I don't mind giving him a cut of my profits. I don't care right. because he did a bunch of most of the work. I got some, he got most. Yeah. But the ultimate goal is the lady who was selling it, she doesn't have a foreclosure on her uh, record anymore we sold the house it took eight months and picture me doing short sale for eight months and speaking on a no i i'm in multifamily. yeah that's what i do it's like auctions auctions are really popular right now because of the foreclosure rate you know with the banks after the pandemic yeah so yeah the benefit you'll have if you just consider doing the powerpoint is you will help lead the sequence of thought processes in which you answer their questions before they vocalize one of those difficult parts is for them to have a blank screen, right? So when you add actually a step-by-step, -step, it gives them confidence because you're actually helping. It's cognitive mediation. When we were teaching school, you're able to help move them through. And then you can drill down to why is a team essential? Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's important for that as well. And uh, I have to prepare something so it'll be easier. I just have to uh, find out if it's going to be doable. But yeah, yeah. Um, with your I, graphics background, you'll like it. You'll enjoy it. Yeah, gee, I'm trying to get, get away. I'm going to hire somebody to do it. I, you know, actually, PowerPoint is not that difficult. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, uh, but it, it that's that's what have, I have learned so far when it comes to team building and going forward. And most importantly, education. I think education is huge. A lot of people can, you, of course, you can, you can do it yourself. Absolutely. No question about it. Connect with a good operator, but it's the same as skiing, right? That's what I always tell people. You can learn how to ski by yourself. You can go up the mountain 20 times. You can fall down 20 times. It'll take you, I don't know, 10 days to learn how to ski. Or you can take a lesson, pay $200. They're going to teach you how to stand, how to fall, how to ski down the slope. In two hours, you'll be skiing, no problem. Same thing here. Pay for education. They're like, oh my God, all these mentors like Cleef and Samrock, Jake and Gino and a few others, they charge a lot of money. Yeah, but look what you're getting out of them. Like I would have never met Steve, for example, if I wasn't in Jake and Gino. And we wouldn't be partners. Same with Yosef and same, same with a few others. So it's really, really important. That's what the relationships, basically you're paying for a relationship. And if you think about it, you do one deal. That's it. It's all paid for. It's all done. And everything is just a plus. Everything, because people know you, because you're like, oh, you're part of this? Oh, yeah, I'm part of Jake and Gina. They're like, oh, yeah. 
that I know that group. Yeah, it's a sound group, of, uh, awesome group. Yeah, I know them. So it it you already have like a different people think about you differently when you when you kind of present be presented that way. So excellent. Thank you. So Vlad, so uh, I know you mentioned you're working on uh, two deals in Dallas. Sounds like right. So what are like what are next steps for you now from here? Yeah, good question. Actually, actually don't know. Um, I was thinking of uh, there's two more deals that are happening in Houston. There's one in Houston and one in San Antonio. Um, we are very very picky when it comes to deals, and by we I mean me and my wife also because i mean we are partners but you know uh we have not only we we don't work with every operator like we don't raise capital for other operators we in all our you know career we worked with two and we knew them we know them for a long time like shirayer we worked with him and we know them for over a year so uh from jake and gino and um um he I know them as a, as a business person and um, I met them a bunch of times. So I think that, you know, it's, it's okay to do deals with them. Right. So we look at deals with specific operators. So I could approach him and say, Hey, listen, what are you working on? How can I help you? And uh, in many cases he might say, Hey, listen, we're working on a deal let's say in Houston or San Antonio. So, um, we are finishing the we finished this the current raise already we purchasing um a new um property uh in 14 days and then after that it will be something else most likely it'll be another syndication and uh it's i think it's going to be in houston i already have my eye on it i like the houston market very much especially it, it has a lot of growth um it's still it's very saturated yeah but the deals are there and a lot of them are falling out of contract so there's a lot of desperate people that are looking to refi because their you know rates are floating now and look what they have to refi into right seven percent and they didn't expect that with what two three more hikes coming up i think we're going to see even more desperate people in the in the space and um i think this is the best time to buy because a lot of people are afraid, but if the deal works, it works, right? If the numbers work, they work. The, the, I mean, what are we looking at? Uh, let's say uh, insurance rates in Houston, 1100 $1, per door. Yeah, it's a lot. But as Shariah said, he said, it. that's a seller's problem. It's not my problem. I can buy it, but it's a seller's problem. He has to give me a discount. So I can so I can buy it, right? Or find me another insurance person that you know, so I can. Uh, so actually, few few deals got killed by insurance in Texas, and uh, unfortunately, that's 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 the you know what can you do? It is what it is. Uh, Florida, te Texas, very high in insurance, and now you know te uh, you know taxes are coming up as well. But um, right now, this is what I'm looking for uh deals in kansas city and texas so yeah most likely it'll be texas mm -hmm. um do you guys have any other any other questions i have a question a lot so maybe you can talk about like how do you choose partners you know how do you choose the uh, people to work with you know because again face is face you know and dating it's dating and marriage it's a marriage you know so like how do you like well, what's your process of thinking you know what before you actually start working on someone yeah um i i want to know if they're focused and uh, i know it might sound harsh but i i prefer not for them to have any life-changing events okay. like for example if they're going through a, a divorce for example, um, and I'll tell you why. Because if you buy, if, when you buy something, and like a, a person's going through a divorce, for example, they're going to be concentrating on that divorce, right? 
they're not going to be concentrating on the business because ultimately you're buying a business. We are all business people here. We're buying $50 million, you know, apartment complexes. So you're buying a business. So they're going to concentrate on something else instead of the business. So who's going to suffer us and investors. And that's, that's, we shouldn't have that. And another thing is, let's say they're going through a divorce and this business might be involved in some sort of a litigation. So that can, you know, that can really shake up the whole, the whole structure and the way you uh, uh, do returns or can even, I don't know, alter the whole, you know, returns or exit strategy. Um, another thing what I'm looking for is somebody that's opposite of me. Because uh, let's say I'm an underwriter. I don't need an under the underwriter. I can underwrite myself. I want another underwriter because I don't underwrite, right? So uh, I want somebody like, for example, that might have um, background in finance because they know numbers. They know how to do Excel, how to run, how to run, how to organize everything. Or um, I do asset management, yeah, but somebody that boots on the ground, for example. Because I'm not in Texas, I can't be boots. Uh, somebody that's there, that's you know, um, and I really prefer that that person does not have a W two, and I'll tell you why. Because let's say hy hypothetically an emergency happens, and I call that person at three p.m., and they're not picking up the phone because they're at work, right? So if they you can't pick up the phone, you can only be only be reached after five then it's kind of like, hey, listen, come on, let's go. There's, there's an emergency. You have to be at the complex. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. And they're not picking up the phone because they're working from nine to five, right? So it's just a preference. I know those are kind of harsh realities and a lot of us have W-2. Well, you know, uh, a, a lot of investors have a W-2, which, which is totally okay. But um, ultimately, uh, before getting into a deal, you, you have to be like, hey, listen, I got a W-2. I cannot be reached, let's say, before 5 p.m. You know, this is what I can do. I can have a smaller cut, for example, right? But I promise I'm going to make up on the weekends, blah, 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 stuff like that. So it's it, you, can, you can make an adjustment uh, to everything, but still have, uh, um, have them as your partner. So these are just a few things. And of course, if you just click, you know, he, he, like I, I look at Steve and the, from the very first meeting, we just click. We like each other. We have fun. We, you know, we saw each other, I don't know, uh, 15 times, I think, over the past uh, year and a half at uh, various meetings here in New Jersey, New York area. And we, we just click. I just like him as a person. So I know I can, I trust them. I can call them. He's he's a solid operator, same as Yosef, for example, um, or um, Hendra or Joe Sullivan, uh, Marco. You know, great solid guys, dependable, great operators. So I just kind of, you just kind of vet them. You work with them as just just talk to them as friends, and then eventually get into a deal together. And you know, of course, you hope that everything's going to be okay. But, you know, I think a year's worth of getting to know them, I think it's okay to uh, be in a deal together. But time will tell. I don't know. Ask me in a year. <laughs> Maybe I'll change my mind. Change it. No, I mean, nothing will be stagnant, you know. Like, uh, well, you might know uh, things are changing for each person, you know. So, and what, what, what size of uh, team would you recommend, you know, like usually like um, a good size of... Because I... I mean, Two, three, like uh, I'm now in some group with five, six people, and actually one is getting divorced. So that's that's a very good uh, point. You know, it's good that I asked. You know, so I just uh, again, they're all kind of newbies. I'm part of a sub two is with Space Morby. Space Morby, yeah, great guys. Morby and a Fortune Building. So I like I'm part of two other groups. You know, so yeah. So, so one is getting divorced. So we are like five. We're six people. You know, I think it's a big. Uh, it's two of a big uh, GP group, and you know, like, uh, what, what, what do you think would be like uh, an optimal size? Yeah, good question. So it's like this: when I first got into a uh, Texas market, I connected with few people in Jake and Gino that were buying stuff in Texas. There was twelve people there totally, 
and I learned a lot and everybody was underwriting, but not everybody had the same buy criteria. So me, Jen and Jeff, we kind of clicked and we just three of us, we started working closer together and underwriting deals, working on deals because we had the same buy box. We were looking for the same thing. But then ultimately we thought, what the size of deals can you buy, right? Let's say we all can raise a million dollars, right? So that's our limit. We can't raise anymore. So why would you look at deals that are like 200 doors? For example, forget about the price that you cannot buy because you cannot raise more money because you have to raise a lot now. Then we started speaking with other operators. Like for example, uh, like I mentioned, Shariah from Massive Capital. And he goes like this, but if you're looking at bigger deals, bring us in, expand your team, right? So have a core team that underwrites, that look in the deals. Let's say you can take down up to a hundred doors. Great, work with your team, do your thing. You can manage it successfully. You can run the place. You don't, you don't need a larger team. But let's say you lock up a deal at 300 doors. What do you do? You start like panicking. But no, you just bring in another team. Let's say Massive can back us up on debt or asset management, just hypothetically. So now a team expands from three people that are core people into 12 people. We Because it's a larger deal. Yeah, there's more GPs. But since the deal is larger, you're still kind of getting the same amount i should say or same responsibility or you can say hey listen i'm gonna do most of it and you just back me up on equity just raise capital for me and that's exactly what happened on mccallum communities we were i was um, on a team uh but to buy 419 doors in dallas right so what happened was hampshire capital got a loan assumption of 2.9 percent and now asset managing 419 doors in Dallas. But they asked Massive Capital, us, and I work uh, with Massive in this uh, particular case, to raise the equity, right? So we were raising 9 million for that deal. So what happened is they're running, Hampshire is running uh, day to day, and we're just coming in with equity. So you can bring teams together to take down larger deals. So, I mean, and also another thing, like uh, another person that I was uh, working with, Tony, he, 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 his metric is really easy. He goes like this, unless I make $50,000 a year on the deal, I will not be in the deal. So it, you can think of it that way. Just, so basically take the number of GPs, uh, divide by the, uh, you know, GP share and, you know, times, times 12. So if it's 50 or more, he's in the deal or he'll consider it. If anything less, then, you know, he's out. He's not going to, it's just not worth it for him. So that's another way of kind of looking at it. If you want to look at the numbers. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. So in terms of like, do you finding what I know you mentioned like some direct to owner that you've done before and actually acquired one deal that way it looks. So what is your, is that something you're pursuing more in the future or, or focusing more on uh, bigger size deals that you join the team for those and so forth? Yeah, good question. Um, before I noticed that people were very eager to sell because the rates were less, we can order more, we can offer more. And they're like, oh yeah, uh, they were, throwing out crazy numbers, but numbers still worked because the rates were so low. Now they still want, the sellers still want those crazy numbers, but we can't just give it to them anymore. So we are offering um, like lease options or uh, loan assumptions, things like that. Um, a lot of, some sellers don't like that. They're like, oh yeah, well, like we were speaking with somebody in, uh, in Houston and uh, the seller, she doesn't care about the property. And it's it's small. It's just 20 doors. Uh, and she's like, I want all the money up front. I'm like, but we can't give it to you. The numbers just don't work. Uh, we'll pay you a little bit now, like $500,000. And in two years, we'll pay you $2 million. So she's like, hmm, that's pretty interesting. So it's kind of a creative way of purchasing things. You have to look at things creatively now. So 
to answer your question, I still go after direct to seller leads. I don't find them as eager to sell. You just, I think you have to kind of work them more, work them longer. Uh, on average, it might take two months. I know some people take taken eight months, a year to kind of get a relationship with the seller and they would trust you and they would sell unless they're really, really desperate. Um, so I do a combination of both. So I have my calendar blocked off, very important, very important to block off your calendar, do direct to seller, do your calling, do your texting, whatever out, outbound messages, whatever you do. And then also, of course, look at uh, larger deals, speak with brokers. You can do that. Um, or you can have somebody else, your team members speak with brokers and do capital raising or work on larger deals. So I'm doing both. Um, so so yeah. what? So just a quick question. So let's say for code calling in Mount Farm, do you use Costar and kind of phone numbers from that? That's your data source? Yeah. So we pull Costar lists. And uh, CoStar provides phone numbers uh, of property managers, brokers, and sellers. You can additionally skip trace them and be more dialed in because most of them are LLCs and corps and trusts. So it's it's a mess. It's not like you know just an individual person. It, it's a it's a you know LLC, and those are difficult to get. But CoStar has it. It's it's pretty accurate. At I would say mostly um it's it so you it it and it's not a lot of them so you can do it yourself uh so i use coastal lists i technically pull let's say a list of uh properties from 1970s and and up in a different class depending on which size but also don't forget mom and pops they have um properties that are no more than 100 doors so you can find a hundred, maybe they have a little more, but anything above a hundred, you're already speaking with a broker. Brokers involved in many cases. Um, anything below a hundred, you might be able to get uh, direct to seller. CoStar, um, I heard Rianami, Rianami is also pretty good. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I haven't, I know there's a lot of people that are selling those lists. I don't know how good they are though. I don't know how accurate they are, but I'm, I'm if you think about it, just in the whole Houston market, there were 2,000 properties or transactions that happened. So it's not a huge list. It's not really huge. This, you know, because it pulls like buyers and sellers. I'm not really sure uh, the way it pulls, the way it works. But my whole list is like 2,000 people, 2,000 uh, records. That's all it is. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. And, um, so are you concerned about like the market being overheated or like some of the price declines in um, Western mar market so far? Uh, I don't think it's, I'm not really concerned. No, mm -hmm. I think that the market is, it, I mean, yeah, the, the, the rates went up really, really, um, you know, increased significantly, very quickly, way too quickly. Typically, they go very little, like 25 bips, no more. This is the, I mean, we had three jumps, 75 or more. It, it's, a, it's a big, big jump. So I think people are just kind of got scared because of because of such significant increase. I think it, it, it just adjust. You have to adjust quickly and just make a quick adjustment. And uh, But people are still buying. People are still buying. You see deal flow everywhere. You, you see deals are going on all the time. People are selling. You just um, you just have to basically tell people, hey, like this, I can buy it, but you have to buy it with these numbers with because of this, this rate and this insurance. Everything has increased. Look what's happening here. <laughs> In some cases, I call like this, like a seller goes to me, no, 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 no I want uh, $5 million more. And I go to them, would you buy it at five, to $5 million more? And they're like, whatever, it's not about me. I'm like, exactly, you wouldn't buy it. So why are you offering it to me? It's not going to cash flow for me. So I'm not really concerned. I, I, I think everybody will adjust. The sellers will come down from, you know, 
the moon with their prices and um, um, yeah. what can we do? It is what it is. We just, in my opinion, deals will, there will be a lot of deals coming up, a lot, because a lot of those loans are coming due on a refi, on a sale, and uh, mm -hmm. they won't be able to refi. Mm -mm. So they're gonna have to force to sell. They, uh, they, they're gonna have to be selling. So that's what I think. Um, so so what is the best way for people to reach to you and or anything else you want to kind of share with our audience before uh, um, we finish for today? Yeah, uh, you can reach me. I'm all over social media. There's not mm -hmm. a lot of Vlad Arakchev's out there. So I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. I started TikToking. I'm not even sure what I'm doing on there. Don't ask. I'm not even sure if it works, but yeah, I'm there. And uh, I... Um, uh, my email, I'll, I'll put it in the chat, but it, it's really easy. It's You can do, just for the ease of it, vlad.arakchev at gmail.com. And uh, I have my website up. We finally finished it. It's zanticventures.com. Um, and you can sign up. I sent some newsletters. I'm not spamming anybody. I do send newsletter uh, once a month. And uh, I try to keep it really short, like really short, just two pictures, two small articles, and that's it, because I know people are busy. They're probably looking on a, on a cell phone. I don't want them to scroll a lot. So just few things, market updates. And uh, if I see something's like really cool, because I, I tend not to give a lot of information that's un unnecessary, just like really cool. Like for example, Tesla is building a battery factory in Austin. I think that's pretty cool. So I put that on there. That's going to be coming up in mm -hmm. you know, next month i think i saw that one actually oh. but, yeah okay uh, so, like that. i'm not putting there yeah <laughs> okay okay well that's great so that was awesome thanks for having me here today it was a pleasure uh, we had some great questions as well so it was nice thanks guys have a good night of course thank you thank you